started from last winter. It was in the course of my PhD research, and I sat down to read Marie Melvin's 1987 book, The Night as Frontier. Now, I know most of you are familiar with the book and the earlier article, but both texts uh, present Melvin's discourse on the expansion of human activity into the temporal frontier of the American night. But I want to go in a different direction today and draw from one particular statement that Melvin makes early in the book. Uh, uh, so you can see it. Oops, sorry, don't know if my button didn't work. So Melvin writes that as we move into the night, we redesign our community to be ever wakeful. Now he's not specifically addressing urban or architectural design, and yet I couldn't help but wonder what this wakeful city would be. Certainly the word redesign infers adapting existing structures to new criteria, new programs. It seems relevant to ask, therefore, how architecture can in generating possibilities in the nocturnal urban landscape. And ideally, changes in social, the social organization of a community would be reflected and reciprocated in the configuration of place. Melvin himself, in his 1978 article, writes, and I quote, no time has ever been used without also being used in some place, unquote. So there's a need, I think, for architecture to accommodate this momentum that nocturnal populations have, as Melvin says, stirred up. In more recent architectural thinking, Johanny Palazma tells us that architecture is in fact our primary human instrument for relating to both space and time. Architecture infrastructures provide parameters that help to situate us within our world. So in theory, architecture is responsive to our needs. But as Henri Lefebvre observes in The Right to the City, infrastructure can't do it all. We need alternate places and times for encounter and exchange. So between the government and economic agendas, which are certainly manifested in the built landscape, there remains opportunities for nocturnal populations to participate in constructing their own world. So, here we arrive at what Nick Dunn has referred to as the dual character of the city at night. On one hand, we have the physical city with its unique configuration of solid mass and open space articulated as building, bridge, street, plaza, park. And this footprint isn't static, but in a city such as Paris, France, where I'm conducting much of my research, there is an easily recognizable structure. It's what Tim Ingold calls a building perspective a built landscape to which social and cultural meanings have already been attached. Now, on the other hand, night overlays the known city with shifting synergies of illumination and shadow, altering the way we see and respond to the built landscape. The spatial context is both familiar and it's different. But within that difference, we, we find the agency to interject uh, alternate scenarios which are often manifested in the multiple and diverse ways in which we choose to interact and employ the, the city at night. What we don't have is some sort of final frontier. So if I can finish with Melbourne, here's where his discourse is spatially problematic. While cities have edges and borders, we can't ignore uh, the negative and painful representations of frontier and colony that already exist and have meanings in architecture, such as frontier or colonial architecture. Now, Rob Shaw has written a great deal on using frontier in night studies, and I like his image he gives of zones of contact, where the many different identities that make up the night populations are engaged in simultaneously and overlapping spatial perspectives because all of these colliding paths create momentum. Just as when Schlor in, in Nights in the Big City, he speaks of all these different nocturnal reporters who each with their own distinct footsteps not only add uh, to our knowledge of the night, but they move this knowledge forward. Now, considering the uh, large amount of built space, exist within the city, one way that architecture can participate in nocturnal experience is through reuse and adaptation. Matthias Amigo of AWP Architects, he, they've done a lot of research and teaching on urban night. He says that buildings have a right to be something other at night. And he gives the example of a school being used after hours as a social center, or maybe offices sharing, you know, space uh, in shifts night and day. 
Oh, in the city of Paris, back in 2010, when they conducted their big survey and program on looking at the night, one of their findings was that Parisians didn't necessarily want new venues erected. They wanted greater access to what already exists. And in the picture I have there on the slide, the building on the right uh, is actually office. It's a design center. It has rooftop restaurant. And down below, it has uh, an all-night uh, club. And it also acts as a beacon for the city. It contributes to existing nocturnal typologies, such as nightclubs and entertainment venues. But of course, it is very large. Most co-opted spaces would need little to no building intervention. Um, but they would require planning decisions, and that's something also that architects can get involved in. Now, Armageddon also says that buildings have the right to be nothing at all, to sleep. And certainly the city at night enters a phase of recuperation. But even sleeping buildings interact uh, with the night. They form the walls in the analogy Chivalbush uh, uh, gives of the nocturnal street as illuminated room, where and these walls that, that become the, the, the facades, which become the walls for the street, they can be solid, permeable, or reflective. But unlike the walls of an interior room, they have mass and um, depth that allows them not only to envelop, but to dominate, uh, and also to read as void. And this is something I noticed uh, doing night walks across Paris's Ile de la Cité. This was before the devastating fire in 2019. The island saw over about 30,000 tourists a day to Notre Dame. And yet at night, with under 1,000 residents and blocks of dark and vacant government buildings, much of the architecture disappears into silence and shadow. It has no weight. So in my overall research project, I kind of focus on these walls, or, or more precisely, the assembled architectures that in darkness frame the nocturnal street. And I use architectures in the plural to recognize, as notably Tim Waterman has advocated, contributions for the field of planning, landscape, urban design, which are all equally integral to this framing. Now, lighting design is already at the center of urban nighttime experience. And, um, but don't talk too much about artificial lighting. It's because I'm very interested in what happens to our understanding of built things when the lights are turned off or at least turned down. My thinking is that if we can identify qualities within the built framework that enhance the experience of nocturnal urban space, we have better design tools to accommodate the fluid relationship of darkness and light in all its variations. So as many of you know, uh, France has begun implementing strict new legislation to reduce light pollution and decreasing hours of illumination and changing technologies. So the city of Paris is by no means dark, but it is getting just a little bit darker. Now, for people who design buildings, uh, architecture without light is sort of counterintuitive. It means moving away from this pedagogy of architecture is light or form made visible in light, which is something Corbusier said. But Le Corbusier also said that um, both light and shade are fundamental elements of architecture. Obviously, one allows us to see the other. Until there is too much artificial light, then as architect Stan Jacobs from FAT says, uh, the bulk and mass of the building begin to feel immaterial. We, we lose nuance. So I think if we can step back from a sort of a dominant discourse of light, we can begin to explore a built landscape that has mass, scale, profile, texture, all of which contribute to our perceptions of nocturnal space. So as I said, these are not dark, but darkened spaces, and, and they'll still be shaped by tonalities uh, of light that's real important to architects like Louis Kahn, but they'll also have a materiality that Nick Dunn has described as porous or sort of deep and gelatinous. So in fact, when, um, when it starts to get, when we start to have darkness that blurs the edges, we go back, I think if I go back a second to plasma, he says that we, that creates a greater sense of connectivity within the space. And this happens as deep shadow not only alters our sense of depth, but opens up perimeter sensing and encourages what he calls tactile fantasy. I'd be more inclined to call this tactile awareness. 
because you know before there was street lighting um well roger eckert in the book at days close he gives lots of examples of how night walkers could find their way by discerning the different paving surfaces i mean today we're starting to see new materials including textile and paint finishes which absorb and emit light that assist in wayfinding while keeping light levels low and of course, darkness is itself um, a material to contend with. It's one that is seen to both fill and to pass through objects in space. And one that light, uh, light can be used to generate possibility. I mean, why, for example, can't we use the outline of shadow to inspire new forms of night architectures uh, that can be attached to or overlaid with diurnal forms? Now, as I touched on earlier, um, for my own PhD work, which I'm still working on, I employed the process of night walking to study how the built framework can generate possibility within urban darkness. So at Limerick, I'm working in two schools, both with architecture and humanities. And that's good because it pushes me to pull from a range of texts and films and theoretical works, which touch on the form of the night and how this form translates to moments of experience. Because you have to think that in architectural urban uh, design, there weren't a lot of text to fall back on in terms of darkness and night. You know, you, you all are starting to create them now, but they weren't there when I first got started. So generally, I'm focused on what Lefebvre termed non-potentialized space or in the utopian equation, ideas of no place. And it's a little different from concepts of, say, terrain vague or you know, the kind of fringe perimeter spaces. Um, in that a non-potentialized space can be found anywhere in the city. Certainly, yes, on those edges, but also in the historic center or between two office buildings. So I like to always uh, go back to something Marc Auger wrote um, in non lieu or non-places, which is that we're always creating two spaces simultaneously, the one we choose to pass through and the one we choose not to pass through and trying to discover why nocturnal populations will choose to pause within one space or appropriate certain spatial frames brings me back to the same observations I discussed on uh, materiality and the form of the built envelope. At least that's what I'm looking at. And this drawing here is, uh, on the left is a classic Rob Creer drawing from Urban Space, a very old book. Uh, but I put it up because you can start to imagine how different profiles, uh, you know, the walls that, that frame the space can be affected, certainly with shadow or create dark spaces. If they lean back, they disappear into the sky. And if they lean forward, what that does to the space. Just as the larger photo speaks to how shapes begin to shift in darkness um, to offer something perhaps that's not visible by day. So the overall obje objective is that um, when we do have opportunities to insert or add on new architectures into the frame, we can better consider how the project will not only be interpreted in darkness, but how implicated these design decisions are in meeting the needs of nocturnal populations. Now, another thing we also need to ask a little bit, and that was touched on um, in this morning's presentation too, is language. And I'm not going to read through this, but I just started kind of putting together um, certain urban terminologies that I gleaned from, from books on and articles on night studies. I will have to add uh, into what's intimacy, I think, so, but there was, um, I mean, these are important in the urban context, but we need to also define them in what we mean when we're talking about night. You know, certain things like legibility and transparency see, tend to start to have other meanings. And, and are these desirable qualities that we want at night? So just to conclude, I state in my, um, my abstract uh, that architecture is never neutral, just like Mr. Ensor says, you know, dark is, is not essentially neutral or positive or negative. But for architecture, I think what is important is that those involved in architectures uh, engage with the environmental, the spatial, and the social complexities surrounding the urban night, that they become part of the conversation and can be instrumental in generating their nighttime experiences. I mean, we've heard from several people involved in uh, these domains during the conference. And back in March, I was, uh, you know, when I was before I was locked down, I was speaking at an international uh, conference, architectural research PhDs, and many of them 
after I, I spoke, you know, so they'd never thought about darkness or the night or the wakeful city. You know, they were keenly interested and we've, we've kept up a dialogue. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, but I think, you know, having, getting more people in design into the conversation that we're having over these two days is, is essential. So for myself, I'm at that phase of my work where I'm starting to document and compile my research project in a visual form, um, one that can speak to, to architectures. And without the depth and visit, vista uh, that we can see by day, each darkened spatial frame resembles an almost cinematic frame to me, as I see it. So I'm starting to look at, you know, whether I'm going to use drawing or video, perhaps, or modeling uh, these spaces. Um, and that's what I'll be doing this year. So I hope, you know, if we all meet up next year in Lisbon, that um, you'll get to see what that was. But uh, thanks for that. And I'm happy. I know I went through the some of the um, references really quickly, but you know, I have them all, and I'm happy to share those. Thanks. Thank you. So now I it's time for Carolina. Carolina. Oh, now I'm unmuted. Yeah, can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, now it's okay. Yeah. Okay, can you see my uh, presentation as well? Full screen. Okay, okay. Uh, so thank you for having me here. I uh, really enjoyed Claire's presentation. I'm uh, past uh, this stage and I actually finished my PhD and my presentation will be more formal because I want to show you in generalities how my uh, PhD and the research was uh, um, being made and it's on the topic of lighting and its role in how it creates co creates the nightscape of the city and I will maybe add something to Claire's uh, citations. Kevin Lynch wrote that um, the beauty of the state uh, house coupon in Washington um, lays maybe not, not in the, the fact that at night it is identical to its uh, daytime appearance, but that somehow it is resembling what uh, it looks like, looks like uh, during the daytime and that we can make some kind of um, recognition of it at night. So um, during my research, there was this notion of abundance and of um, the elasticity of light forms as a tool to co-create the night imaging of the cities. And as this process is fully controlled by humans, uh, one would say that probably we can do anything with it and we in fact do uh, present our cities at night uh, the way that uh, we want to uh, present it. But actually, is this possibility really reflected uh, in the reality of the nightscape? That was a question that I made. And uh, factually, with lighting tools, we can at night reveal the values that exist in the cities uh, at night that the objects co-creating the urban interiors during the day, like historical, architectural, artistic values, etc. But also with light, uh, we can si simply add new uh, values, some symbols to them, uh, and actually simply without destroying the urban interiors. So uh, why do we still see such views that you can see in the presentation right now? which if you think about them and if you see them, uh, the notion of uh, lighting chaos uh, comes more to your head than the beauty of the nightscape. And um, in my research, I checked quite a few documents on lighting master plans, mainly for the cities in Poland. And what surprised me is that apart from the technical issues, so you could read about uh, light flux, luminance, illuminance, color index ratio there. The evaluation parts of objects, building structures, or 
areas uh, you could all you could also read about touristic values no other mention uh, no other uh, values were mentioned or hardly ever mentioned so you couldn't read about the image of the city the perception readability or recognizability uh, of those places so i decided that in my research i'll try to or make an attempt to add some uh, new values uh, to those tools that are being used um, especially in Poland. I'm not talking maybe about Lyon and its uh, wonderful master plan, uh, Plan de Lumière en Adou. Um, I'm, I'm talking about more, mostly the Polish situation. So there were some questions that went alongside my research. So how does lighting affect the image and expression of the urban public space? What kind of tools of the lighting instruments can be used to create specific visual effects? And how can we analyze value and shape the night city landscape? Uh, I've done a research in this um, reflectance of the, the design process uh, made in circle where each of the stages of survey analysis and synthesis um, process, um, uh, they give the data feedbacking one another. So in the first phase, I made a study on different lighting forms found in the urban public space with green spaces and their surroundings acting as a field of research. So it was aiming to see the totality of the tool that we have. Uh, all the research was based on public spaces in Warsaw mainly with some additional spaces. The second phase was a study on the role of lighting in the process of shaping the image of urban space at nighttime. So to see what kind of changes the visual representation of the objects and urban interiors um, happen to have at night. Uh, and the third phase was um, a study on the night landscape of the Vistula Riverbank in Warsaw as a way to develop a method for evaluation of the urban landscape. So each of the phase having uh, its own objective, they all serve the, the, the overall purpose of the work, which was to make a comprehensive study of the role of the lighting in the um, shaping of the night image of the city. I will not go into details of the three stages, but I will like briefly describe what happened there. Um, so for the first one, I just wanted to uh, combine all the categories that I found in different literatures regarding landscape, uh, urban design, architecture, etc., cities, and try to make an attempt to make a some somewhat classification of uh, of the external lighting fight found in the urban public space. So I did it based on the green spaces in Warsaw plus 40 different projects installations worldwide. And I thought it would be big enough uh, probe so that I could do uh, everything. And with uh, the public parks, uh, some 20 of them, I analyzed them more into depth in order to not only to make a survey of uh, the life forms that exist there, but also to make the first attempt to see what kind of influence they have overall in, on the urban interiors and their images. So uh, in, in, uh, in return, I uh, created, a, maybe I would not call it a classification because uh, maybe a sort of typology and an open one of different categories of uh, lighting forms according to light source function, et cetera, et cetera. I will not present uh, uh, all of them, but you can see how complex that is. Uh, given only one of them is being described here uh, to more uh, uh, to depth and it remains open as the um, tool is very elastic new forms appear and it can never be closed so the second stage was uh, studying the changes that happen to the images of the objects uh, at night in comparison to their uh, let's say normal natural uh, daytime appearance so I turned to architecture over there, of course, architecture located in the public space. Uh, also here, a sample was quite uh, big because I took uh, 70 um, buildings, structures like bridges and also different scales of monuments and plants uh, into account. 
Um, I visited them at night and uh, during the day. I made photos of them from um, several points, each one compared to different to the two of those periods, day and night. And um, I analyzed them graphically. And then what did I check? I checked the object's visibility. Uh, hello, can you hear me? The object's silhouettes, so that the form and the resemblance of the form at night in comparison to the daytime. The background vis visibility, because of course I did not want to uh, see the objects and analyze objects themselves, but also the, the surroundings. I guess you are wellies. Uh, and then the divisions, architecture details, and the colors. So uh, you have to know that those objects were regarded as um, elements of uh, urban interiors, so walls, surfaces, um, elements, landmarks, etc., etc. So, uh, in all, the 70 uh, objects and surroundings were analyzed, and uh, when I compared them, it turned out that I can um, describe them into five categories of typology of change that happens to the visual representations of those objects at night. So, if the objects or the surroundings are not lit at all, uh, either by some kind of uh, direct illumination or indirect lighting that stumble upon it like street lamp posts, they tend to disappear out from the visual representation of the of the urban interiors. Uh, on the opposite side of it is when the object and its surroundings are being lit, illuminated with distant illumination, wall washing, and their um, night image resembles uh, to great extent what happens during the day. So you can talk about a reflection of their image at night. When the object is being focused on, so we have a strong, strong illumination towards the object without the, their surroundings being lit, we can talk about the extraction of its image, um, which uh, has a great uh, um, compositional impact. Uh, we can also talk about supplementation of the image when some new uh, added value is being made, is being put on the image of the object, so building structure, etc. at night. So here you can see the colors um, with this dramatic temporary um, installation put on the Prime Minister siege uh, in Warsaw. And then we can talk about uh, transformation of the objects when there is something, some portion of light being passed onto the object, but somehow it does not resemble itself during the night, which can pose uh, some issues tonight for in terms of recognition. It can be positive of, or negative. I'm not trying to say what should be done, but what is possible to make. So as I described those categories, I told you about the, the types of illumination that happened to those objects. I also in my work, uh, compared those the, these categories to some theoretical approaches to the light. For example, the category of light in the theory of Genius Lotzi by Christian Norberg Schulz, or to the famous Richard Kelly and his three triple types of light uh, put onto the design, the, this um, ambient light, focal glow, and play, play of brilliance. So I, tr I wanted also to show that it can be simply put, this typology can be simply put into some kind of representation and maybe design process at this beginning stage or evaluation stage. You can see here the silhouette um, of the city of Torun in Poland and its night representation. And I made this bunch of scenarios that present what would happen to this um, silhouette when we add added or removed something with lighting so you can make landmarks removal or you can uh, present some hierarchy of the space with uh, some sort of lighting for example with colors you can uh, put some effort or focus shift towards uh, a special place uh, in the uh, urban interiors the last stage was about um, development the method for evaluation of the night urban space and I did it in for the river banks in Warsaw uh, by the Vistula River from both sides and also of course the panoramic view that 
are transformed with this with them you can see that those river banks are really uh, vary from one side to another we have the built uh, um, part from the left side with old town with skyscrapers and the right side uh, which is uh, built up with natural component so um, this um, this uh, study was to make a comparison between the nighttime and daytime first uh, uh, compositional and viewing uh, analysis in form of a big map was made for the daytime in the middle the um, three types of different analysis were made first the visibility of the space that we are taking into research from the from the surroundings was made daytime and nighttime then the second the analysis for image variability of objects co-creating space space composition for for daytime and nighttime using the typology made in um, uh, research in the second phase and then the composition analysis for the most important views formed in those spaces at last we can make the second uh, map with uh, evaluating composition and space views for the night time and i will not go into details i will just present what forms of maps were done that's the first one made for the daytime and the night times so you can see that it's not only the river banks themselves but also the those buildings that co-create the panoramic views were taken into account so i will finish with uh some examples of photos that i um of the situations uh, that i stumbled upon during the night walks that i made so many of them uh, during the research where you can see that you can really put some focus onto details and onto um, the object at night and actually without light you can remove uh, some uh, objects that uh, buildings constructions which which can be quite uh, actually quite important uh, during the day you can put some emphasis and add, add new symbolic values to the um, to the space and also regarded um, to not only to the architecture but also to the monuments uh, you can reveal the structures uh, with different sorts of uh, lighting and you have to be really aware of uh, where the light is being put on uh, because the light sources uh, tend to really influence the, the recognition and the, the visibility appearance of the space which is very crucial to the uh, green spaces uh, you can also form uh, smaller interiors with light alone uh, when it's um, powerful enough without adding some physical uh, elements like walls etc um, I also stumbled upon because I was always amazed with the mirror effect of, um, of water um, during the night but uh, during the research I also kind of thought that it can also somehow manipulate the space. So what should the acquired knowledge about urban lighting in public space be used for? First, I would say that it should not be used um, for uh, such things when we want to lead up and show, reveal some important monument, but uh, we reveal it in fact, but also we make it look a bit silly. <laughs> um, that if we made an effort for some illumination, uh, and um, lighting of some structure, we should really take care of the maintenance of it. And um, I wanted to make also aware of the situations that sometimes light, lighting some space uh, can actually feel, get people less comfortable than if there was no light space uh, over there. And I will finish with what you saw already in my background, which shows the power of this tool which uh, can transform the space um, really greatly to a great extent with the video mapping made to those uh, four uh, French rivers fountain by Bartholdi made uh, during the Festival of Light at De La, Lumiere, De La Lumiere in Lyon in 2012, I think. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Nicola, uh, it's your time. Okay, so let me just share my screen. Okay. So you 
are spoiled by my last <laughs> my last slide. So thank you very much, Manuel, for all the work you did to maintain this conference. Thank you, Claire and Carolina, for your two presentations. It was kind of really, really instructive. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I am from France, from Nantes, and I'm still under my PhD uh, writing. It's really close to the end. And uh, at first, I'm an architect and a lighting designer, no a researcher uh, at the AAU lab at the, the Architecture School of Nantes. Um, my uh, research deals with tools and methods to involve public space users in the evaluation on the design of nocturnal urban ambiances. And this work has now been implemented at Nantes Metropole as part of the development of the public lighting management scheme. Um, I will present you today the Observatoire de la Nuit. It's a digital survey tool made for users associated with a mapping tool for the representation and analysis of physical and sensitive data. Uh, it stems from several prior tests through which we have always asked the same question. How can we involve users in the future of nocturnal and urban ambiences? So our first steps, um, we started with uh, some surveys about how people feel while using new lighting technologies. So you have an extract here. It was kind of uh, a small, small leaflet like this. And um, we have the purpose of uh, saving energy with lighting reduction. We had uh, really serious difficulties to get and keep people involved. Uh, and just a few of them did it until the end. But among this low representation of users, we found something. We found out that people were capable of analyzing parts of the cities they were not asked to. We had data about the energy consumption, like here, and uh, of each point light, and we showed it to them, and they just started to talk like, uh, here there is a consumption, but no light because of trees they recently planted for the first one. The second one said, here there is a lot of consumption, but I feel insecure because of the news I heard about this area, which is on my way home. And the second one here just said, um, here there is a lot of consumption, but at a certain time of the night, there are no more cars, everybody is home, and there is still a lot of light polluting the Loire, which is the river at Nantes, and its inhabitants. So people knew about light consumption, feeling of safety, mobility, even ecology, without any need of any kind of pedagogy or awareness. But more than that, people were, um, sorry, people were talking about space and time on a map. We understood that we could save a lot of time and get a lot of data about nocturnal urban ambiances with the tools that could combine survey and map. If we could find the right people to fill it, as I said just before, getting common users is kind of difficult. So we all have better things to do at 6 p.m. between work and personal stuff. Uh, so who is at work on the public space at night and through the whole city? Drivers of public transportation are. So we met them, we built with them a precise and adapted survey. And we made this survey more interactive by adding a digital map to indicate the precise area where they were felt some good or by, bad sorry, feeling of comfort. And by the way, we focused on not using at any time the word like, light, or diet, or, or dark, sorry. <laughs> sorry. We just asked them about their feeling of comfort while driving through the night. So here you can see the, the, the layout of the survey. Uh, it's a split screen into two parts. On the left side, you have the, the survey, which is deliberate, de deliberately simple and collects the following indicators here. The public line operated by the driver, the geographic localization of the observation. On this precise point, we added a mapping, uh, mapping marker here. Um, 
because the driver wasn't allowed to use devices while driving, so he can answer the survey only at the end of his shift. In order to facilitate the localization of the observation zone, he or she has to grab this small blue marker and place it where a negative, neutral, or positive feeling of comfort was experienced. Then he or she has had, sorry, the date and the hour of its easy. observation. He easy, so to say, but um, yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. Now you can talk, Nicolas. I had to mute everybody. Please unmute yourself. Nicola, please unmute your, your microphone. Who mute me? <laughs> Everybody else, we had some interference. Okay, so um, drivers finally had to grade their feeling of comfort from one, which is the lowest grade, to five, which is the highest grade. We we uh, have this survey for one month and we received this, uh, 65 answers, each one duly marked and commented on almost, almost every path of night lanes. And this useful involvement highlights the ability of participants to be independent and to go beyond usual survey standards. And besides, we think that such an independence allows the evaluator to give personal and concrete feedback given that there is no bias from the frame of a group evaluation that might not be at the time he might have chosen. So we, we, held, we held this survey from 15 January to 15 February this year. And the sensitive indicators that we gathered were then injected in a, into a second mapping tool, so which is here. And this second mapping tool allows us to represent the indicator especially on color coded, which facilitates the reading of the different perception of visual comfort. At that moment, we have a global vision of the local sensation of comfort across North Metropole. To better understand what makes those sensation, we can access, like here, the content of each contribution with just a click on the icon. Uh, it allows us to know the line, the date, the hour of the observation, and um, the note regarding visual comfort on its explanation. Everything is written here for every marker here. On this scale, we can see that most of the contribution are below average in orange like here or red like here. Um, only a few indicators reach four or five on five, like some green one here or blue one here. So one question arises, is public lighting the only cause of discomfort? And to answer it, we look for the transversal physical indicators associated with nocturnal urban ambiences and lighting. Still on map, we have the light points on the essential photometric criteria, like here, you have the type of uh, point light, SHP for sodium. We have the color temp, 2000 of degree Kelvin, sorry. You have the energy consumption just at the bottom, which is here, 150. And you have on the left here, eight, which is the construction high. Um, as much data as we can regarding public space. So we also have the type of streets, the protected natural areas, and industrial, not worthy, and common buildings, night hooting places, here the drinking places, and not to be forgotten, heat maps about energy consumption areas. areas sorry. So at this stage, we have a global representation of the city showing both, both physical and sensitive indicators of nocturnal urban ambiances. And we can start drawing the future construction site for public, for public lighting. For example, ensuring more respect for the environment close to protected natural areas or reducing energy consumption of energy intensive areas. 
However, by only starting from these physical indicators, we can create discomfort for the users. For example, here, uh, the city chose to turn off the light at 11 p.m. each day, even if the tramway keeps going up until 1 a.m. Um, the driver's comment translates their feeling at 7 p.m. here with the light on. Their comfort is 5 on 5. At 1 a.m. here with the light off, their comfort plummets at 1 on 5. So thanks to these comments, we can start accompanying, accompanying the cities in its sobriety policy, its desire to turn off the light to preserve energy on ecological resources can be fine-tuned, for example, by keeping the lights on until the end of the transportation shifts in the area where they operate. We can call this adaptative maintenance, but two other types of maintenance are available thanks to the indicators used by the driver. We have the curative maintenance, because the drivers indicated many areas where public lighting is out of service. And then we can have preventive maintenance because the driver also pointed out to place where the light flicker announcing maybe an imminent failure. But beyond maintenance, these sensitive indicators allow us to anticipate upcoming events and upcoming development works. For example, driver can indicate references area in terms of nocturnal ambiances. Here, very good lighting to be taken as an example. Um, in terms of uh, the physical analysis of such, such place, which we are working on at the moment, could work with the development of tramway lines and stations that are currently under consideration in Nantes on help with the production of nocturnal ambiances with lighting criteria adapted to the need in this case in this case of the drivers so according to us digital consultation include includes many useful elements for the evaluation of current environment and for the production of future one more importantly the consultation allow allows us to place the user as an actor of his or her environment and to raise awareness on the field of nocturnal urban environment and then to help action of sobriety that are already sought after. So beyond a survey tool, la, our work is more precisely a tool that meets the challenge of our research, which is the pedagogy of light sobriety. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for the interruption before, Nicola. It was quite interesting, the presentation. Um, I will invite David to take the, uh, the word. David. David, you have to unmute before. Go ahead. We cannot listen to you. Can you hear me now? Perfectly. All right, okay, great, thank you. Okay, can, is the presentation clear? Can everyone see that? Full screen. Okay, great, thank you. Let's see if that works. Uh, right. Um, the project is, thank you very much. Uh, the project disappearing in tonight was made in and around old Doha in Qatar in 2016 and 2017. Um, this neighborhood is ongoing large scale inner city redevelopment inspired by contemporary design processes and Qatari heritage. Um, the, the work was Primarily a photographic project, it started as that, but elements of sound and audiovisual practice developed throughout the time being on the ground in Doha. Uh, the district portrayed in the images, and there's, there's more, more information on the website, um, is populated predominantly by male economic workers or 
that uh, attracting flows of migrants from African and Asian countries, including Ghana, Somalia, Sudan, Nigeria, Kenya, Bangladesh, and Nepal. So open it would change the next image, but it won't. Um, subsequently, a rapidly growing population and built environment increases air and noise pollution. Uh, this private enclosed space of large construction sites spans week by week, uh, changing the built infrastructure of the environment. Temporality is an important structural component in forming the photo series, which considers how the afterglow of overhanging floodlights merges with fluctuating climatic conditions in the built environment to force fresh visual landscapes in Doha. These dialectic images help define the city's social geography and ocular identity through exploring rapid ar architectural reconstruction taking place in the city. The project aims to explore how artificial light forms auditory conditions and ocular stimuli to visualize power relations that exist in architectural sites occupied by unsettled expatriate workforce. Uh, from these sites, the quality is frequency of light changes and intensities shape the ocular composition of the area. Crumbling buildings, buildings become saturated by obvious light and instinct light energy generated by construction sites and residential spaces in surrounding areas. As a result, shadows are utilized as dialectical metaphor. The presence of shadows indicates the solid reality of the buildings, yet light is temporal, obscuring and opening up spaces in the cityscape. Thus, tactile collective spaces merge with nocturnal architectural backdrop in changeable landscape that is often appears structurally uniform yet is socially contingent. As such, darkness closes down space and illuminated light redefines image composition and opens up opportunities to visualize social boundaries. Therefore, spotlighting how decisions to illuminate or leave in shadow can be an exercise of power as well as the promotion of architectural heritage and redevelopment. Feeling and senses at atmosphere through my body is significant in project development, and this embodiment becomes a vessel to conduct and transmit electronic signals. Furthermore, repetition and mobility and migration are themes utilized to encounter architecture, visual and sonic media. The presence of shadows in the pictures indicates uniform and solid reality of the building. Yet, as I noted earlier, it's the contingent and obscure site that is revealed in the cityscape. These shared spaces are multiplicity of events occur, gener generates what Deleuze describes as distributed space, where chance plays a significant part in redefining the distribution of space, exposing sites where social and structural infrastructure merge to form and enhance ocular dialectic, the ocular dialectic portrayed in images, in the images. As a result, exposing traces of precarious communal activity or unofficial organization via audio visual media identifies how construction processes could be informed and reproduced by people who build as much as those who design Gulf cities. For that reason, the project divides into two parts. In addition to writing refle written reflections and photographs focus on nocturnal sites, the work in progress aims to consider how energy generation, consumption, circulation, and air pollution merge with and separate ocular and audio at landscapes, sites that seem to have no distinct presence or absence in and around building developments. Information and communications technology in the body are devices to reveal and peel away some atmospheres where, which are invisible to human eyes, yet are, when heard through information and communication equipment, penetrate the body and direct vision to new sites to be seen. I continue to work on the project and would break down my working technique into three areas of research, exploring processes of electronic transfer, muscular and kinetic energy in conjunction with acoustic images and photographic soundscapes. 
three points are investigating and hearing visual motion, exploring conceptual resonance between image and sound, discovering intersections between what is seen and what is heard. I'm interested in spatial and social distinctions between noise, sound and signal and how these phenomena possess or penetrate architecture and its inhabitants. Meaningless, obtrus obtrusiveness and stressfulness are new themes under investigation. Uh, reduced listening is significant and over time complex and prolonged audiovisual processes have evolved in the research. New performances and disembodiments of sound as mobile social practices enable new ways of registration and amplification to highlight unseen sonic atmospheres. Influenced by the co-presence of passing traffic, fused with embodied experiences stimulated by sensations and encounters during excursions in the city. In addition, illumination and spotlighting is also a device to navigate through material structures and is the repetitive act of walking along city streets and roads, places and fosters spatial awareness of new visual identities in the metropolis. The act of listening becomes a mode of seeing. Such research forces a rethink of the way scales and location can offer starting points to develop practical and theoretical frameworks to explore fresh perspectives on how mi residents, migrant workers and tourists interact with architectural base bases in and around the city. Wandering at night investigates the indeterminate space between what is visible and invisible, offering opportunities to discover how the visual electromagnetic spectrum seen by human eyes and cameras image centers merges with radiant flux, the unseen light energy, radio frequency interference submitted and transmitted or received by information and communication technologies. Pause a minute. It's like technical hitch. All right, back on track. Roaming helps new provisional sites emerge as ocular pauses, momentary fragments of cohesion that punctuate intersubjective experiences en route, creating a field of view that was reliant on human paths and sonic routes and channels crisscrossing neighborhoods. Transitional spaces of cultural and historical hybrid Bredity woven between architectural spaces become apparent in Doha and enrich conceptual frameworks to make new work about labor flows in the city. Moreover, if an, if an entire city is conceived as an archive, buildings are not only sites of infrastructural order but become active through architectural deconstruction and reconstruction, delineated by an assemblage of activities and events created by inhabitants in particular places and moments in time. As a result, the points of navigation are continually moved, which produces a sense of disorientation and disruption. Subsequently, the social imagination could stimulate memories through repeated acts into Doha cityscapes, triggering new photographs, audiovisual works, and soundscapes that express the city as archive, thus revealing links between inhabitants, architecture, technologies, and then digital infrastructures. Climatic conditions affect the practice of walking as, in, as an embodied research methodology. If one's body becomes part or an extension of the edifice, then one begins to become centered, merge and mimic its shape and form. As it has, and this has a significant impact upon the perception and recording of analog and digital signals in the area. However, Walking in sites designed for motorized travel could offer autonomous opportunities to move freely and weave within city spaces intended to direct users towards particular destinations. In these settings, the practice of walking is a polluted environmental experience as standing still in dust and exhaust fumes generate social and physical barriers. Nevertheless, these ever shifting boundaries create fertile ground from which the urgent imaginary can arrive from the Anthropocene. In conclusion, the ongoing research cross-examines distinct challenges facing Qatar's construction and infrastructure growth in line with the National Vision 2030 Development Plan. 
and the methods employed by the state to address environmental and pollution issues, for example, the acquisition of more advanced technology. Thus, the work takes into account how planning processes affect structural division and social cohesion and environmental impacts of architectural heritage and technology and energy generation, consumption and circulation in the country and along the Arabian Peninsula. The photographs and soundscapes within this series highlight the fluid threshold between private and public spaces by exposing permanent and impermanent traces of migration nestled within the change in architecture. The project continues to focus on subtle imprints made by dynamic social interactions where people rest, worship and trade amid these construction sites, locales that appear to be silent yet in reality never sleep in the 24 sky glow enveloping the biosphere. Thank you.